In the 1980s and 1990s, there was a fierce rivalry between two gaming companies, Nintendo and Sega. While I wasn't super invested in the rivalry that went on, it often went that you either tended to have Nintendo consoles like the NES or SNES, or Sega consoles like the Master System or Mega Drive known as the Genesis in North America. My childhood fit this as my family was a Nintendo family, so I grew up with an NES and an SNES during that time. Growing up with the NES, I was exposed to the series Castlevania. I would rent the first two games at our local video store that also allowed you to rent video games. I eventually wound up owning Castlevania 3 at one point and remember playing it quite a bit and beating it multiple times. The reason I bring all this up isn't because I'm doing a video on Castlevania 3, but rather on a game that takes a lot of cues from Castlevania 3, from gameplay to graphics despite being a modern game, and that game is Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon was released in 2018. It was developed by Inti Creates and is available for PC, Switch, PS4, and Xbox One for $9.99 on all platforms. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon is a side project and stretch goal connected to Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, which was funded via Kickstarter. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon is a retro-style adventure platformer that takes a good deal of inspiration from the early Castlevania titles. In the game, you play as the character Zangetsu, a swordsman searching for revenge upon demons and has made it his life mission to destroy any demons he comes across. The game starts as he senses a powerful demon and goes to destroy the demon in the hope to break the curse that he is under. If you've ever played a Castlevania game, you'll feel right at home with the gameplay style here. Each level is a combination of platforming and fighting enemies. Zangetsu as a swordsman, wields a sword against the demons and has a number of special abilities that he can use as well, like a ball and chain he throws diagonally up in the air, a magic charm that he throws on the ground in front of him and burns for a while, and a skill that gives him increased damage for a time. As Zangetsu completes each of the levels, he has to face off against the boss before he's able to progress to the next level. These bosses can be quite challenging, but once you're able to figure out patterns and know when and how to attack them, they become much more manageable. These bosses can range from a coal-eating demon train, a demon that seems to be made of money and uses gold coins to attack, to a demon based off the stories of Elizabeth Bathory who supposedly bathed in the blood of young women. There is a good amount of variety in these battles and most of the bosses also have a final shot to try to take you out before they die themselves, so you'll want to be careful with that. Over the course of Zangetsu's journey, he meets three other characters that can be recruited as allies after defeating the first three bosses, Miriam, Alfred, and Gebel. These characters all have their own abilities and specials. Miriam uses a whip as her main weapon, has a slightly higher jump, and can slide through narrow paths. For special weapons, she can have a throwing knife that throws just a single knife straight ahead, three knives that fly kind of in a fan in front of her, and then a throwable scythe that acts like a boomerang, as well as a giant axe, which is really slow, but does a lot of damage. Alfred is slow and has a very short health bar starting out. His main attack is slow and has a very short range. He seems to attack with a wand or a short stick, but he does have a variety of magic spells that are pretty powerful. He can use a fire scroll that creates a defensive circle of fire around the character, an ice arrow that freezes whatever it touches, an illusion that creates a double in front of Alfred and can attack enemies, and and a lightning attack that follows enemies for a certain amount of time. Gebel is slightly different from the other characters. His attack is a swarm of bats that will fly in front of him, creating a bit of an arc attack in front. This attack is great for hitting enemies that are slightly above you in some spots. Gebel, though, doesn't get any special weapons. Instead, he can turn into a bat, which allows him to fly to hard to reach areas, go through small cracks in the wall, and get past certain puzzles and obstacles really easily. You can do damage while in the bat form, but if you are damaged, you'll turn back into a human form and have to hope that you have a place to land in the process and don't just fall into a pit. While Bloodstained Curse of the Moon has a retro style that is reminiscent of the early Castlevania games, Curse of the Moon does have quite a few additions that are more modern that either weren't on the radar at the point of the earlier games or just weren't able to be done. Some of these are just standard today, like save slots. Unlike some of the early Castlevania games where you had to just restart or use a complicated password system to pick up where you left off, you can use a save slot and pick up right at the start of the level you stopped at. This also allows you to save multiple playthroughs if you're wanting to play a different ways for each save. So why would you need the multiple save states, you might be wondering? Well, that's because Curse of the Moon has multiple endings. The endings are based on how you interact with your allies. When you meet each potential ally, you have three choices that you can make. You can recruit the ally and be able to switch to them at any point in the game as long as they're alive. You can kill the potential ally because you think they're tainted by demonic power, or you can just let them live and ignore them. This allows you to have three different allies at the same time, none at all, or some combination of in between. You can kill some, recruit some, ignore some, you know, however or whatever that combination looks like. If you choose to kill the potential ally, you wind up gaining a special ability, like a sword slash attack from Miriam, a double jump from Alfred, or a dash ability from Gebel. Well, Castlevania 3 did have various endings depending on which ally you had at the end, it was really nothing too complicated. Since there are more options in what you can do with your allies in the first place, this makes the endings also wind up to be a bit more complex than just changing the same basic epilogue, adding a little segment about the character who you had, like Castlevania 3 does. Uh, a certain ending even adds a 
bit of story and has a whole another chapter for you to play through in the game that takes place after the kind of the main story of Zengetsu. So there is a bit more going on here ending wise that can have you coming back and using the different save slots for your various playthroughs. One other addition that I found very nice in the game was the ability to pick between veteran or casual modes to play through the game. Veteran is more difficult as it has a live system, gives you less points to use for your special weapons, fewer power ups and a significant knockback which can be super tricky in areas where you have to use your platforming skills in areas with pits or hazards while enemies are nearby. This super knockback was really popular in like the NES time where just get one hit and you'd fly backwards and usually with a lot of the platforming games would fall to your death. So that's kind of what's what's going on here with the veteran mode. Casual gives you unlimited lives, ups the rate of power up drops, gives you more points for using your special weapons and reduces knockback significantly. Personally, I started on veteran but eventually moved to casual and enjoyed the game quite a bit more mainly because of that ridiculous knockback. However, both are available depending on your play style and what you're wanting to do with your games. But either way, it doesn't matter because whichever option you choose here doesn't affect endings, trophies, achievements, anything like that. So it's really just up to personal preference whether you want to go for the really super retro experience or whether you want a more casual approach. One other thing that was added into this game is the ability for kind of permanent power-ups. You can increase health, increase attack power, and increase defense by finding pickups and levels, which was something that I don't really remember happening in some of the early, early games. Maybe Castlevania 2 because it was so different, but again, like it's something that's a little bit more modern to have kind of upgrades that you can find and depending on how you play they are more or less available depending on the allies you have some you need certain allies for one last feature in the game that i feel is a bit more modern is the titular curse of the moon that you can use to go back to previously beaten levels in the game and kind of rewind time it's basically you like a level select or the closest thing you get to it and i never really used this feature as i didn't know why i would really need to but it is there if you want to i just tended to start a new save for each playthrough but i guess you could go back using this to go to earlier levels and play through things differently and getting different endings just on one save slot but i as i said they give you enough save slots in this game that i just went back and and picked a new one for a different way i was going to go about getting allies and things like that trying to go for the different ending in addition to the main game there is also a boss rush mode that allows you to tackle all the bosses in a row if that's something you enjoy to be honest i've never really been a huge fan of these modes because most of the time it always feels a bit tacked on but it is here if you like it and enjoy that kind of challenge so I think that should give you a pretty good feel of what the game is like. So why do I recommend it? First, I really enjoy the action platformer genre of games like this. I have fond memories of the early Castlevania games and, and this fits that mold very well. Some could argue that it's maybe a bit too close, that it's not really got enough going on for it that dif differentiates it from some of those early Castlevania games. But I do think it adds enough to the formula to stand on its own and is an enjoyable entry in the genre of games it's going for. One thing I never liked about the earlier games the, the NES, it was that super knockback that I've mentioned a couple times earlier that you would get when hit by an enemy. So I must admit I was rather happy to have the option to turn that off. I know there will be those who disagree and will enjoy that challenge, but for me, I was happy to not have to worry about it. I will also admit that most of the common enemies here, like the, the ones you find in the levels, felt a bit too much like subpar Castlevania knockoffs, and it might have been nice to have a bit more creative enemies, but it's, it's not a huge complaint. I know what they're going for, and they, they tried to kind of keep to that inspiration. Second, while I might have found a lot of the basic enemies kind of generic, I really enjoyed the boss fights and felt that they were the highlight of the game. Uh, I really liked the design and variety of the bosses. It felt like a good deal of the creativity regarding enemies was channeled into these boss battles because they were all pretty memorable experiences for me. It was always interesting to see their different set of attacks and even cool to see like what their last chance attack and trying to avoid it would be. I felt like difficulty sometimes was a bit uneven. You know, you'd have like some really easy ones early on, but even early on, like level two, level four, there would be ones that I struggled with a little bit more. Um, nothing too much. I, I beat them multiple times, so it wasn't anything, but I just felt like it was a little bit uneven. But I'm also willing to say that could just be my playstyle and maybe just the easier time with certain types of bosses than others. Lastly, I really enjoyed all the options and endings available in the game. As I mentioned earlier, I'm glad that you could choose between casual and veteran modes and that whatever you chose, it didn't block you from getting any of the multiple endings of the game. I think my experience with the game would have been a lot less enjoyable if I had to stick to the veteran mode, especially to get all the endings of the game, trying to play through and, and do everything with that really bad knockback would make the game a lot more frustrating, I think. Regarding the endings, I really did enjoy getting to see kind of the different ways that everything shook out at the end. I would say that the endings aren't 
all amazing, but they were fun to see kind of how things went differently. I did get a bit tired of the game while going for the last couple of endings, but I think this was because I had achieved some of the more interesting and easy to get endings first, and the fact that I did all this in the course of a week, so it was maybe just playing a little bit too much in a short period of time. Personally though, I enjoyed the ending where you recruited everybody to your party the most. I think it made for the most enjoyable playthrough, but it was also because it felt like it was the most developed storyline of the game. So I have fond mem memories of the early Castlevania games, and Bloodstained and Curse of the Moon will definitely remind you of those games. It's possible that it may remind you a bit too closely of those early Castlevania games, but to be honest, I enjoyed the feeling of nostalgia here. And while I think I would have liked it even more if we maybe bumped things up to like a 16-bit graphic style, the game still brought me back to the memories of the past, but it still held its own and brought enough character to make its own impact on me. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm feeling like I'm just playing Castlevania. It was a different game, and, and there was a lot of feeling that it was a different game, even though you could definitely tell where their inspiration was from. I'm not sure what you would think if you approached the game without the exposure to the games that served as that inspiration for Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. If you like action platformers with a supernatural theme, then I think you'll still enjoy this game, even if you haven't played any of the NES Castlevania games. I'd say that even if you haven't played these games, Curse of the Moon is still a fun game to play with some interesting bosses. While the extra choice options and extra innings may not be impressive to those unaware of the older games, I think they're still a good addition to the game and allow for a lot of flexibility for old and new players. All this to say that I really enjoyed my time playing Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. It's a solid game in its own right, and the nostalgia factor just made me enjoy it more. So that's why I'm giving it one of my gold stars. I know it makes me want to try both Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, which this game is a prequel or spinoff of. I'm, it's not really clear to me how the story connects to this, or really if the story connects to this game or not. I, I don't really know. But also Bloodstained Curse of the Moon 2, which I think just released not too long ago. So yeah, so I hope that you'll enjoy this game as well. Thanks for watching this video. I hope that you found this game recommendation and review helpful. If you did and you want to watch more of my game recommendations, feel free to check out the Gold Star Games playlist on my channel. My hope is to continue to make game recommendations as well as other video game content on my channel. So if you did enjoy, feel free to subscribe so that you can keep track of when I release new videos. Thanks again, and I hope you're having a great day.